thank you everybody for joining the care for rare webinar um care for rare webinar is being organized by organization for rare diseases with the help uh, of uh, uh, our sponsor life cells uh, and uh, this particular webinar series uh, is being created with the help of researchers physicians and everybody to raise awareness about rare diseases in the time of covid where everybody uh, is talking more about uh, covid we also want to keep the conversation going on uh, what type, what are rare diseases and uh, how um, uh, other uh, researchers researches that are being conducted in the rare disease group and rare disease uh, per se impact rare diseases and our understanding and uh, uh, process that is required to uh, go for the cure for each of the rare diseases which are at least 9000 to 10000 in number and uh, in india our definition of rare disease is at least 5 lakh uh, patients per disease that um, the not more than 5 lakh patients per disease is calculated as rare diseases and uh, today we have with us dr aditi bhattacharya uh, worked on fragile x syndrome in fact she uh, has she is she is one of, she is the recipient of uh, fragile x syndrome uh, research, uh, research foundation fracture fellowship award and she also has a prestigious charles h revson senior biomedical research award and uh, she currently works at institute for stem cell research as i told you before where she uh, looks at uh, developing protein proteomic biomarkers for understanding the uh, the diseases and um, uh, fragile x syndrome is one of the uh, uh, disease that she concentrates on uh, at ncbs national center for biological sciences she also works on uh, g protein signaling it is one of the specialized uh, uh, receptors that are present on the cell surface and they control how the cells behave for the kind of information that is coming from outside the cell so she studies both the genetic component and uh, how the cell responds and also the environmental to cell that sort of relation uh, she studies and uh, i'm sure uh, by uh, listening to her we would get more insights in understanding how to integrate uh, the metabolic biomarkers dynamically um, at proteomic level and also how uh, natural history of the particular disease is important to document and to look how how to look at the natural history side by side with uh, other molecular tools that we have um, over to dr aditya bhattacharya uh, welcome ma'am and uh, please take over thank you so much and welcome and uh, thank you to all the people who have taken time out on um, today to actually uh, listen to some of the work that i have been doing in the past about 10 years and the process of engaging with uh, basic researchers clinicians and parents of uh, children with rare uh, brain uh, conditions and how that has actually um, tailored a lot of the research that i have um, um, done and i will probably be engaged in in the future so without further ado what i'm going to do is i'm going to share screen and i'm going to share content let's hope this works uh, can everyone see this? Yes, Dr. Is that yes. visible? Okay, cool. So um, I basically am structuring this in order to ask pretty much a question and to engage with you in understanding whether or not this question can be um, answered with the tools that we have and whether it just is about a lack of tools or is it also a lack of um, thinking about it with a different kind of approach, a more holistic approach. Um, so what I'd be talking about is, this should work. Yes, okay, cool. Um, so what I'm basically going to be uh, trying to present is about rare neurological genetic disorders and how they've been very much a mainstay of understanding a lot of neurogenetics about the brain, how it develops um, in disease, as well as in a lot of uh, cases um, of, and how that is pretty different from the complex disorders like schizophrenia, 
depression and um, uh, such that you know we have for a lot of these kinds of situations now uh, obviously one is thinking about a brain a, an organ system which is inside a lockbox which is a skull so you need to start thinking about figuring out uh, biopsyable biomarkers in a slightly different way and how um, there are certain very strong home truths that one really has to know about that you know one has to end up uh, thinking about and how that has actually come through in some of the work because one i started as very much a hardcore molecular neuro uh, neuroscience person and then as i said through my engagement with parent groups with clinicians um across uh, multiple uh, uh, world areas as well as um, different places what i found was that one had to start thinking in a very different way um, i was blessed enough to have very good collaborators who were also thinking in similar ways and how we slowly had to parse this together and also face systemic challenges of how we like to uh, airbrush a lot of the difficulties etc so what i'd like to do is share with you in the second half of the talk more like a journey of how we've pretty uh, pretty much try to develop a very nascent blood based biomarker to look at stratification for fragile x syndrome and of course tying it all together and then having a discussion with all of you about how things can go forward in the future so neurobiology neurological disorders and rare diseases there is definitely a nexus if you actually look at this excellent perspective from nature medicine um one finds that the the number of that cns so the central nervous system related rare genetic disorders is actually very high this is basically showing the kind of uh, uh, you know about 74% of all the conditions have some kind of a neuro um a symptom a neuro uh, you know a neuro um, effect of it and it slowly progressively sometimes comes over as the person ages now um it's not just a specific kind of a neurological thing though neurodevelopment is very high um it can come up as movement disorders coordination it could affect emotion and mood it could affect the intellectual disability definitely um so it can essentially present itself as a global developmental delay it could be very it could be a uh, ataxia based thing it could be hyporeflexia etc so it it actually covers the whole spectrum of what we would consider as a neurological disease however from a very um, from a very uh, let's say blinkered way of how a person who is a lab scientist and a bench warrior would start thinking about is that a neuroscientist would start thinking about these rare genetic diseases as excellent model systems to look at how the dna to rna to protein to the circuit level to the network level changes are actually impacted and hence we have a lot of enduring animal models um, now uh, you have patient derived cells etc where one starts getting these con these very consistent disease phenotypes that seem to actually go across from the humans to the model systems to the patient derived cells as well a uh, case in point here happens to be a tuberous sclerosis uh, 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 complex one kind of a deletion um so tuberous sclerosis actually seems to have a very very consistent eeg uh, problem it actually comes up as epilepsy intellectual disability um some amount of it autism and it seems to be fairly conserved as you know you can see in the lower half of this panel and you've got uh, uh, knockouts in worms in zebra fish you've got knockouts in um uh, mice of course rats as well as a non human primates also so one can actually start looking at how how um, you know these changed um, systems tend to interact with each other as well as the fact that we also get to know more about what the protein actually does or in a probably in a normal course of development 
Now, this is all very good because it actually helps in progressing neuroscience and progressing our understanding of biology as well. But when we have solutions that come out of this, sometimes they get over interpreted. And the reason also happens is, and the place where a lot of clinicians, and right now I can't see your faces, but I can expect a couple of head shakes here, is these are the kind of actual quotes. These are actually people who've said these things to me that my son has an X kind of a mutation. You can't find medicines that work. And if you do have medicines, you can't predict whether they will work for me. And you actually expect me to write a check of a substantial amount of money to actually fund your research. This is something that actually came up. Um, the same way um, in a clinical trial, which overall did not work, somebody else said that my son responded to a drug he cannot continue because and this um, um and this parent was extremely upset with the statistics that was there is that some statistician found that the average didn't move then you have something that i heard in india is that um are you giving my daughter some kind of medication because that's the only thing that you're allowed to give and that may not be the right thing to give so these are the kinds of places where we have an absolute utter um, breakdown of all the science that we've been doing. And it's fairly disheartening when you as a scientist end up um, you know, having to face these kinds of questions and you don't have answers. So at some degree, apart from the rational scientific approach, one, I was also motivated emotionally after being in a fair bit of these kinds of situations where I really didn't have answers. And I wanted to figure out why. So the way in which clinicians and basic researchers tend to approach human biology and ah. disease biology is a little different. Um, is there a question? I think we're going to take all the questions at the end. Is that what's going to happen, doctor? How would do? uh, uh, I think. Uh, if, if anybody has any type of questions at this juncture, you can put it in a chat box uh, when the occasion comes. Let, uh, uh, there is a time for. Okay, so I'm going to continue. Um, so, the way in which we tend to look at it in the lab is we have a we have a gene uh, deletion of some sort. This is going to affect the genome and the phenome in the way in which we have. And then we start looking at whether or not we can find correlates of it in the actual patients. The clinician, on the other hand, is actually looking at the patient and then starts looking at the genetic basis of it. So what is presented first tends to color a lot of our um, uh, the, the way in which we give emphasis to various uh, effects. Um, what is important to note here is that, well, why is this not working? Yes, that we're looking at an area of variation which comes up because of the metabolome, the proteome, the transcriptome, and the epigenome, which is getting affected or tailored by the context or the environmental extrinsic factors as well giving you something which happens to be the phenotype. The phenotype may be a normal healthy individual phenotype or it might be a disease phenotype. But the reason that I'm bringing this home is that when we talk about risk factors, when we talk about doing a genetic screen for something, a, um, rare disease carrying individuals are going to continue to have that mutation or the abnormality in their genome throughout their life. However, as a lot of the people who work in the rare disease area know that it is progressive because obviously a lot of the intrinsic and the intrinsic environment, the stimuli are changing as the child grows up, as the child is transitioning into an adult and the adult is slowly aging. So the variation in the dynamic areas of the metabolome, proteome, et cetera, are going to change and hence the phenotype also changes. This variation is something that is very scary because obviously, you know, ipso facto variations can have a gamut of different uh, factors, different factors with different contributing weightages. 
and we really haven't reached a stage in which we have even characterized all of them to actually see what is the best correlate for a certain phenotype or not. But increasingly, we are finding that this is the variation, this is the messy place where we actually have to mine things in order to get useful stuff, which will help not only for basic research, but also for the clinical therapeutics. Now, neuroscience and um, neuroscience-based therapeutics has gotten a very bad reputation of having the worst kind of success rates of preclinical candidates actually going into FDA approval. Now, where is this failure? The failure is actually coming from the fact that you have a patient, you have a patient group, you get a diagnosis criterion, you get the biology and the causation of it, and then one obviously starts to look at therapeutic options, which can then go into usable solutions. Now, this, this entire area of diagnosis to the therapy options is uh, tends to fold in with biology in an iterative cycle. And what actually helps the iterative cycle is if you have a way in which to high throughput look at a test or a machine which makes the diagnosis easier, if the diagnosis is very clear and it's very easy to do, and if you have biomarkers which can actually track how well your treatment options are actually doing. Now, what happens mostly in neuroscience is that you only have a 2% success rate, which is the least of all disciplines, okay? There's plenty of biology, there's plenty of causation that one gets to know about it. But the problem is at this point where the diagnosis is very much a spectrum. Um, it probably has something to do with the way in which we are actually testing the behavior. And we need to have unbiased biomarkers which are not affected by the behavioral the the behavioral variation as well as variation from day to day and multi-site and multi-observer changes as well what i mean by that is that if you have a child with autism and you take um, the parents take the child to three different clinics across Bangalore, depending upon a, what the child performance was at that time. Second, how the, what are the kind of tests which were given and the kind of analysis which was done. You may find that you might get a main diagnosis of autism, but with that the secondary diagnosis might vary. And that may also change the way this the behavioral intervention therapy is actually good. That's just one example. Now let's think about two different kinds of conditions and why I keep on talking about having a diagnostic criteria with the biomarker. So around the time that, and I mostly give an example to students about cholesterol and heart attack and plux and Alzheimer's disease. So this is essentially spreading across 100 years. And what was interesting for me was to see that around the time that one had plaques from, cor from coronary arteries that were sectioned to actually look at what exactly those plaques contain and those plaques actually contain cholesterol. Around the same time, you had upon the death of Alois Alzheimer's, uh, um, upon the death of Augustus Dieter, uh, Dr. Alzheimer's actually uh, sections the brains and he finds the plaques again, which is roughly around the same time period, give or take a couple of years. Now, at the same time, already you have a test that helps determine what is cholesterol and the plaque and the goo actually contains lipids in it. This is not there at this point. Dr. Alzheimer's finds some more patients. The symptom onsets are earlier than usual. Okay. And they are like one or two of them. These are very, very rare, and it's okay. And this is in the 1900s to the 1920s. Now, what happens is that from 1920s to 1940s, cholesterol research and coronary heart disease actually goes through a substantial slew of discoveries. Um, there is a device which has been found which can unbiasedly find changes in muscle impulses. And Herrick shows that basically these abnormal ECGs and blocked arteries share a very, very um, um, uh, strong 
correlation. Then you have a whole number of basic research scientists who tend to throw the kitchen sink at it along with 100 people. And what they find is that cholesterol in the arteries essentially tends to predispose a person to heart attack. This, this sentence takes about 20 years to do. Um, but during that time, during the same amount of time, because of the geopolitics of that time, you didn't have enough number of people who were old enough, you didn't, the attention of the medical community was pretty, pretty different. You don't have more number of patients studied for Alzheimer's disease, okay? The life expectancy during this particular 40 years time was something around 56. So globally, you didn't have enough number of people who would be presenting with Alzheimer's at this time. Again, there was a tool, which was the electron microscope, which, which was used in the late 1950s to 60s, early 60s, where one could actually then zoom in and image the plots. By this time, what happens by the 1960s already, you have Sankyo trying to uh, market the first HMG-CoA blocker compound. So you already had a drug for that. But around the 1960s is when you had enough number of people who started coming up with the diagnosis of dementia and AD, where it basically becomes a health risk and a health concern. So there is about a 20 year age gap. There's, a, there's, 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 there's about a 40 year age gap, um, a, um, a gap in between the progression of therapeutics for these, for these diseases, which actually then translates to the fact that around now you have the third generation targets of cholesterol biosynthesis. You know what are the uh, bad effects of taking statins for a very long period of time. And there is, about thousands and thousands of studies and metadata analysis and such extra that is possible for cholesterol, lipidemia, and heart attack. Whereas, uh, whereas uh, you have, we still are trying to figure out the genetics of it. We are still trying to figure out what are the risk factors, and we are still trying to figure out better therapies for Alzheimer's. So this is where we are. We actually need a test that works very well, which is rather hard for a neuro, a neuro kind of a disease, uh, a neuro, you, you know, a neuro condition. But you also need biomarkers, which in this case happen to be the levels of cholesterol in the blood. Okay. Uh, I apologize. The slides are not moving fast enough. Okay. So what exactly do I mean by a biomarker? A biomarker is a naturally occurring molecule or a characteristic by which a particular pathological condition or a physiological process can be identified. It happens to be a measurable indicator of a biological state or a condition. And biomarkers for neuro uh, conditions requires to have a very strong correlative property. Okay. Now, what are the kind of biomarkers that one ends up using right now for brain disorders we have brain waves we have bold and structural imaging we have uh, for some infectious diseases uh, we have the csf and in very very specific conditions we actually take a nerve or a brain uh, you know a brain biopsy because it happens to be a very very intensive procedure now this is very different from a lot of other conditions so you have about 99% of the diagnosis, tracking and treatment measurements are basically done for mental health based on behavioral tests. This is quite different from I'm sorry, uh, there was a bit of a uh, problem at the door. So, um, so this is very different from the blood draws, where you know, which is something that one does for a large number of liver infections, blood infections, um, a lot of conditions, where we can actually do this multiple number of times. The blood actually turns over um, in 180 days, um, and it's definitely something that can be used at point of care which is a very big thing when one starts thinking about the large population of people uh, with any kind of a brain disorder or a condition. 
Now, the problem with the blood draw always has been the caveat whether the blood and the brain are going to be good proxies of each other or not. And biochemically, do they show the same kind of signals? So with that, yeah, with that, one has to come to understanding what exactly are the definitions of biomarkers and what are the biomarkers supposed to actually do. And the best document happens to be from the FDA, and I call it the best because of the acronym Biomarkers, Endpoints, and Other Tools Resources. This is BEST was largely developed for heart attack, cardiac conditions, uh, diabetes. So it was largely developed for conditions where the biomarkers would be biopsiable within the same organ system in which the disease is. Now, BEST is still rolled out to evaluate uh, neurological conditions. And there are four kinds of endpoint biomarkers that one can actually end up think about here from the blood. First happens to be the pharmacodynamic or the response. That means if one is giving an agent to the patient or the affected individual, do you have the same biochemical target getting engaged? This is important for trial evaluation at the biochemical level and a certain kind of a, 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 a kind of a phenomenon that's known as pathoclesis. That means irrespective of how I feel, there should be an unbiased readout of the, the actual chemistry and the biology involved. That means that even though I'm feeling um, quite all right right now, I may still be having a problem with my lungs and my lungs may not be, uh, may not be able to um, flush out enough of the air. And that's something that I can do with multiple different lung tests tidal volume tests, et cetera. So this is the, the second kind of biomarker happens to be a prognostic biomarker. That is to say whether the disease is present or not. Now, the disease is present or not is something that is important in patient stratification. Uh, it is important at the trial recruitment stage, saying that X kind of patient with this kind of a biochemical profile of the blood will likely uh, respond better with a certain kind of drug versus another kind of drug. So when you are trying to look at one class of drug and you want to test a new class of drug, if you know a certain patient is going to be refractory to it, then you don't end up recruiting that person for that trial. It saves money. It saves the effort that the patient puts in as well as the caregivers. The third kind is a predictive kind, which is something that's very, very easy to understand. It actually tells you about the benefit of taking the drug over a certain period of time, usually used to support the primary outcome of what the trial is supposed to do. And one and anybody who is doing a trial has to end up saying this drug, if taken over the next three months in a patient with a certain condition, should alleviate anxiety or should make the performance of that person better in a certain kind of language arena or a motor uh, coordination arena, etc. This the fourth kind of uh, biomarker is a surrogate endpoint. How long do you have to continue the treatment? If the levels of protein A changes or the levels of metabolite A uh, B becomes very different, that means that the whole biochemical process of resetting the biology has happened and is most likely this is the place at which the patient should start finding an effect. So if one has to think about blood-based biomarkers for neurological disorders, one has to actually have them binned into either of these four conditions. There are, of course, safety and risk effect, uh, the, the, the risk the risk effector biomarkers, which are a different uh, class altogether, and I won't be actually covering any of them here. So I come back to the fact that the perennial question, does the brain and the blood signal the same? Now, what I'm showing here essentially are hand signals, which are from the stock exchange bits of the New York Stock Exchange and the London. And as you can see, apart from the buy cell and the numbers, a lot of them are fairly different. Um, so you can see that may here 
in the London pit seems to be three fingers down, whereas May in the New York, um, uh, the Dow is going to be around four fingers down like that. So what this is a very good example of explaining how the brain and the blood may end up having the same components of signaling pathways, components of proteins. But because the final outcome of each of these organ systems is slightly different, one ends up having slightly different signaling outcomes, stoichiometries, regulatory feedbacks in place. Um, so it's not, um, it's not surprising, but there are more and more reports that are coming out that glutamate happens to be very, very important in signaling in platelets to either see the CD4 T cells or it helps in platelet aggregation and um, it it and a lot of the signaling actually happens through AMPA receptors. AMPA receptors are one of the primary mediators of synaptic plasticity, the way in which the brain tends to encode information. And AMPA receptors are also present very much in the blood. If you ever want to test, you can actually detect AMPA receptors pretty reliably in the blood. You can uh, detect NMDA receptors in the blood. Of course, there's a lot of dopamine and serotonin receptors which are there on blood cells. So all the components are there, You, but you cannot end up focusing on looking at proxies of, of the consequences of what uh, the AMPA receptor does in the brain is going to be the same as AMPA receptor doing it on platelets. So this is very important because when one ends up doing unbiased screens to find various kinds of um, um, candidate, candidate molecules um, to actually go after RNAs or proteins or metabolites, et cetera, specifically proteins, you really have to keep in mind that you may have the same proteins present, but the context of the location matters. And they may not be the same um, surrogate proxies of each other. The second problem that happens is a slightly subtle concept. And I'm here giving example from two of the uh, papers that I had published um, uh, you know, a while back, is that healthy does not necessarily mean absence of disease. Um, so what I mean here is that um, while I was looking at a genetic mouse model of fragile X syndrome, and I again did a genetic cross in order to abrogate S6 kinase 1, which happens to be a fairly ubiquitous molecule throughout the body, I found very, very clean results. And it was a very high significance value. And, I, and it tends to fall into a very simple model that one wanted to posit at that time. But when I tried to do the same thing, using small molecule inhibitors which were given after the animal had uh, become an adult the pushback on signaling in wild types was pretty different from the kind that one would actually get in the fragile x model uh, if i paraphrase this in a uh, in a very current kind of a situation and a scenario in which if i am going from instem in bangalore to nimhans um, before March 2020, I would have multiple ways in which to go. I could actually take the straight blue line, or I could, depending upon the traffic, I could actually end up taking some of the gray line, and then I could take also the, uh, the other green line towards the south of Bangalore. I had multiple options, which is what happens in a normal kind of a situation. However, if I right now want to go from Instem to Nimhans, I'm looking at two different COVID containment zones. And obviously my pathway tends to change. And because my pathway tends to change, I'm going to spend a lot more time, a lot more fuel, and I'm going to have to skirt all of these containment zones and then go to Nimhan. So I'm going to have to plan accordingly. So sometimes we always think of, we are looking at the disease, and if we don't have the disease, we will still have this particular pathway, but we will go much faster. No, not true. The disease is actually setting up a completely different signaling web, which has to be taken into consideration, but also compared with the normal web. We don't end up having much information about the normal web of biochemical reactions, the biochemical proteome, for us to actually know what has shifted. 
and hence what would be the best ways in which the um, system can be jerry-rigged to actually come back to a certain kind of normalcy. It will not be the same as the health, but it will be somewhere in between, which is sufficient for a person to continue a certain way of life. So at this point, what I would like to uh, what I would like to uh, have convinced you all about is that there is a lot of variation and this is the kind of variation that becomes extremely important when one is trying to leverage things from basic research into clinical research. This is also true for rare diseases where we do have very, very high effect sizes in animal models, in preclinical studies, and then when it comes to the clinical studies, because of this kind of variation, things tend to go down. So one has to be able to identify dynamic biomarkers, which actually help in understanding and codifying the variation better. The variations will likely be different between a normal typical data set and that of a disease. And we have to tailor all these things together in order to get usable ones. Um, at this point, I could take a couple of questions or I could jump right into the Fragile X story. Um, sure. Are there sure. any burning questions? Yeah, if there are any questions, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, there are three dots there. If you click on that, you will see an icon called raising the hand. Then we can go one by one. Or uh, if you are the only one, you can just go ahead and ask the question, please. Dr. Aditi. Yes. Yeah, this is Naveen. Um, good evening and thanks for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I have a question uh, regarding this uh, biomarker, what you are talking about. So are you going to uh, explain the uh, technologies or the uh, points which are going to be used to identify those kind of very low abundant biomarkers of protein which can be seen while studying? Yes, that is the second part of the talk. Okay, wonderful. Thanks a lot. I was just curious to know this. Okay, so since that seems to be the order of the day, I am just going to jump jump uh, into it. Uh, again. All right, so let's talk about how one can find or what what I've been dealing with is how to find blood based biomarkers for fragile X syndrome, specifically for patient stratification and outcome measures. This is very much a work in progress and it started somewhere in 2011. So it's taken about nine years for us to actually be able to give very, um, very initial answers to certain overarching questions that have been plaguing fragile X syndrome treatment for a while. So the way in which I think about a non-formalized way is how do you mine a dynamic, my, uh, you know, a dynamic biomarker in an indirect biopsy tissue to find correlates for a single gene CNS disorder. So why proteomic disorder, uh, why proteomic biomarkers, specifically proteomic biomarkers? Because apart from here, I've got the central dogma, fine, but proteins are very much the major executors and effectors of physiology. And proteins are dynamic, so they tend to come up and go down, and they tend to get made on demand. Um, so you get a very, very snapshot based um, readout if you are looking at the level of proteins. Of course, proteins, because they are so variable, they can also disappear and, they, and there is less amount of effect size consistency, therefore becomes a very, very important matter. The second reason why looking at proteomic biomarkers is because neurobiology and the whole process of encoding learning and memory requires on-demand protein synthesis okay now what happens is whenever we are going into the world we are being bombarded by different kinds of sensory stimulus which tends to get codified in a slightly labile kind of a, a slightly uh, um let's say a slightly less dense form of a memory trace this is called as acquisition now, this memory trace, either while we sleep or we are thinking about it differently or we have to present it again, 
tends to get consolidated or tends to get refined and tends to go through a triage process where do I want to keep this memory or do I want to throw this memory out? And once that goes through it, you have consolidation, which then makes a short-term memory trace into a long-term memory trace. And that long-term memory trace, you can keep on going back to, you can keep looking at it from different angles and points of view. What did this person say? What did that person say? Putting in more associations into it. I was wearing this kind of kurta during during this time that, that, that I had an accident or something and all that, and you keep on adding stuff to it. So that's recall also. And at some point of time, you may also think that a long-term memory trace can be forgotten. Okay, I don't require it anymore and I'm never going to uh, want to use it again. And then you have extinction. Now, pretty much all of these consolidation, reconsolidation, recall, extinction processes require on demand, active, and very, very localized protein synthesis. It may be localized in terms of somatic, that means specific cells within a brain area, which are a part of a neural circuit, are going to encode some of the proteins. It can also be at the place of the contacts between brain cells. Okay, it can be exonal or synaptic. And hence, the brain is constantly making proteins, constantly getting rid of proteins, and constantly making decisions of which proteins to, cons to you know, keep and which proteins to throw out, which is important in strengthening the connections between neurons and astrocytes or not. So protein synthesis is something that's very, very important. Hence, when you have undernutrition, there definitely seems to be an, uh, the type where protein uh, macronutrients are actually affected. Um, children start showing developmental delays much uh, earlier than actually any skeletal muscle wasting or stunting actually comes up. So. The third reason, obviously, is you need the right amount at the right place at the right time. So the amount of protein that gets made because of the stimulus is important because it's been shown that neural performance tends to suffer if you have too much protein that is made in response to a certain kind of stimulation or too little of it. Of course, like I said, if you have the wrong neurons that tend to make proteins at a certain point of time, you will likely have different memory traces, traces that tend to interfere with each other and affect performance. And of course, if you have problems in uh, your nutrition or you have problems, you know, a rare disease condition, which tends to affect either the time where the brain develops or during the time when you are an adult or at the time of aging, protein synthesis, then of course, you will start showing behavioral and cognitive effects. Okay, so coming to autism spectrum disorders, and I've just put in a slide here in case if somebody um, here is not familiar with them. Autism spectrum disorders happens to be a cluster of neurodevelopmental disorders, and it has um, um, WHO um, calculates or estimates that it's got a burden of about 2% globally. Uh, there are a lot of uh, reports in uh, the uh, Western countries that it is in one in 68 children. Um, it has a lot to do with diagnosis and all that, but it's safe to say that one in that about 2% are going to present with them. Now, 80% of autism has got a very strong genetic basis. Um, so amongst the genetic basis that is there, you can find that you can have common variants which all tend to add together cumulatively and cause the disease. You can have rare inherited copy number variations. And of course, you have these rare inherited single nucleotide variations or actually the syndromic ones where you have a deletion, a duplication, and so on and so forth. Now, what autism is mostly defined as are problems in three specific areas of um, behavior. One is language and communication. There are communication difficulties. They have social problems of going into a room, into a new environment. They are, uh, the, these people are not able to adjust to sudden changes in the, the people who are there, 
uh, sudden new places, new experiences. They also have very, very intense focus or interests. These are known as stereotypies or repetitive interests, and they will continue to do that. That sometimes comes up as savant capabilities. They can do things extremely well, like play a piano or paint or something, but that's what they always want to end up doing. And obviously, the third thing that they have are sensitivities. They have problems in wearing certain kinds of um, shoes or clothes. They have uh, they they can present this in terms of dietary things. They will not eat certain things. And in order to uh, cope with some of those sensitivities, a lot of the repetitive movements, the hand flapping, the um, the um, kind of walking on tiptoes, etc., tends to happen. Most of these things present anywhere between the first three to four years of age. Um, there is a very uh, a strong uh, mm, presentation of autism in males, but that does not mean that females do not present the symptoms. They are um, just a little more diffuse and masked. Now, coming to whether or not protein synthesis is known to be a molecular correlate or a molecular abnormality in autism yes and there are two different lines of evidence for it one is that if there are deletions in genes that control protein synthesis or mrna translation and translation signaling which is the mTOR pathway the ERK pathway the akt pathway um, these have been associated with um, ASD-like behaviors. Uh, leading the pack, obviously, is Fragile X syndrome here. Then you have TSC, you have Syngap. All of these actually show that. Then in basic biology, just by knocking out some of these translation signaling control molecules, which tends to change the flux of protein synthesis in a particular brain area, also causes in the animal models ASD-like behaviors. So, Autism protein synthesis seems to have a nexus. Um, how well the nexus actually uh, goes on to other forms of autism, which are not caused because of translational molecule mutations is something which is still an open question. Now, coming to fragile X syndrome, fragile X syndrome is essentially the leading monogenetic cause of mental disability in autism. The frequency is one in 4,000 males, and uh, it is an X-linked disorder, so, that it, so it presents less in females. Uh, it's actually caused because of CGT repeat expansion in hypermethyl, and, and that area becomes hyper, hyper, uh, hyper, uh, hypermethylated, which actually does not allow the mRNA to be um, read through and synthesized, so there's a transcriptional silencing and you don't get the fragile X mental retardation protein or fmrp fmrp is something that actually is a translation regulator not only in the brain it's now being found in other parts of the body as well but the levels of it in the brain are exceptionally high um, so um, fmrp helps neurons uh, not known very much about the glial cells um, of doing this kind of on-demand protein synthesis, which is required to encode learning in memory. Hence, if you don't have FMRP, one ends up having behavioral deficits, one ends up having autism-like um, uh, symptoms, and there's a lot of intellectual disability as well. Okay. Now here I'm trying to summarize pretty much 40 years of work that has happened in the Fragile X field, which I'm calling as a discovery trajectory. So Martin Bell in 1944 actually discovered Fragile X or characterized what Fragile X syndrome actually looks like. Um, not only are there mental uh, difficulties, there are also uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome uh, kind of things where you know you have cartilage problems, you've got slightly extendable ears, etc. There are certain facial uh, features that that are associated with Fragile X. And these are the things which actually got um, recognized and categorized. Then in the late 80s and early 1990s was when the gene FMR1 was actually identified. And quickly after that, because that was the time in which mouse transgenics and designer mice started to come out, um, the, the Fragile X knockout mouse was made. And the Fragile X knockout mouse powered a lot of the discovery biology and the disease pathology, which is there. 
and uh, and signaling pathways which were the akt erk and mtorc pathway in neurons was found to be hypersensitive overactive and causing more than necessary amount of protein getting made in response to a stimulation now because these are very much druggable candidates for cancer biology there were already certain pre there were certain preclinical uh, candidates as well as certain clinically approved candidates which were possible and which were there so these were quickly put into place however what was also found is that these mtor erk and akt pathways specifically um, downstream of the metabotropic glutamate receptor pathway in neurons glu the gluar5 specifically uh, seemed to be a very very strong leading candidate and for that then one um, so one actually based on these there were about 8 to 9 candidate molecules which were rolled into clinical trials some of these were very very large multi site trials which were there uh, by major pharmaceutical companies and what ends up happening is um, they uh, throughout 2007 up till 2012 these clinical trials went on and the problem was that all these trials failed in reaching the primary outcome that they had decided upon so there was a lot of uh, finger pointing recriminations etc but when the post-mortem analysis of these trials were actually done and they were carefully dissected it was found that uh, one one ended up having subsets of people or subsets of populations which actually responded to it and subsets which did not so there was a lot of variability there fragile x was re-evaluated in terms of just having a diagnosis of fragile x does not make everything the same you have fragile x with prader willi you have fragile x with williams syndrome you have fragile x with epilepsy all these small 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 subgroups started to emerge these were already known for clinicians but the fact that these subgroups could actually muddy the final trial outcome was what started uh, people to look more carefully into it it also made basic researchers start to think about it and that's where i was essentially in my postdoc and i realized that one of the biggest things that one ended up having was this conserved molecular correlate which was a problem in protein synthesis and of course depending upon where it is context specific one could actually have different presentations of it and hence the variation spectrum so this gave an opportunity of having two different kinds of biomarkers that one could end up using to stratify patients one is to see how much protein general protein synthesis is happening okay that is just to look at the flux of the protein synthesis and if the drug actually was able to affect that in the mouse models and all that it was able to do that beautifully in the brain but we were we were obviously not going to take biopsies of these children's brains to actually see whether the target engagement was happening so the question was whether or not one could actually do that kind of measurable protein synthesis assay in the blood at a point of care kind of a place and the second was going to be what proteins can we mine from the brain which would be the same in the blood and which would then be sensitive to um, which would then show any sensitivity to drug treatments and drug efficacy etc so there were plenty of proteins which had been shown to be not regulated properly in response to stimulation and there were close to 30 40 papers which were there but the problem with 30 40 papers there were each one of them were done in that particular research group's favorite system some of it was in cultured cells some of it was in neurons some of it was in um, certain brain areas different brain areas and all that and one obviously got into this problem that region specificity the kind of um, prep you are doing the kind of levels that you are getting from each one of these so in order to get rid of all that, we, we thought that, and this is a paper that actually came out to 2019, so you can go back and read this um, in case if I rush through all of this, is that we would look at the brain area for a proteomic screen, a de novo proteomic screen, where maximum number of 
research papers for Fragile X had come out. And that happened to be the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a brain area um, which is very, very important in encoding memories and pattern separation. And a very large amount of papers uh, of Fragile X actually happened in that. So we wanted to look at precise candidates. We also wanted to look at what the, what the hippocampus would make in a given time window so that one can actually um, remove, separate all the pre-existing proteins from the ones that were getting made. Okay, How that was different between the control mice and the fragile X mice. Do they always have to be FMRP targets? Do they have to be binding partners or directly consequence of the loss of FMRP? And then finally, which was the most important to us at this point, was whether or not the same kind of things were present in the blood and whether those were going to be sensitive to treatments. or not. So the way in which we went about doing this was essentially known as labeled proteomics. And we combined two different labeled proteomics, the first of which was BONCAT, which is bioorthogonal non-canonical amino acid tagging. OK, what happens in this is that a methionine analog, azidohomoalanine, is actually incubated in live cells. In live cells that are actively doing protein synthesis, so which is actually this yellow star here, and everything that 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 is getting made, every peptide that is getting made, actually gets labeled with this kind of a tag. Azidohomoalanine is not present in biological systems, so. If you have a detection way, which happens to be an alkyne and something that's known as click chemistry, uh, one can actually make a, a cyclized product along with a detector probe, which can be biotin, fluorescence, whatever have you, so that all the newly synthesized proteins would actually have this biotin tag. And one can actually look at it in a Western blot, uh, which is just a gross biochemical readout, or one can actually look at it in a mass spec. The problem is with mass specs is you do have run-to-run -run variations which happen, and it is not necessary that the zero homoalanine tag will actually come into all peptides equally. So we wanted another peptide which would be, you know, another label which would be present, which allowed us to combine the control and the diseased um, tissue together and have a ratio metric within sample comparison. For that, we went and combined BONCAT with something else that's known as SILAC, where you have these differently labeled uh, weighted arginine and lysines. Okay, The nitrogen and the carbon have got different isobaric tags. And one can actually combine the two so as to increase the amount of newly synthesized proteins that one can get. So this is a, a thing that we call as BONLAC, which was basically a combined proteomic technique. And we first published a paper that this thing actually works in adult brain slices because almost all of the work had been done before this had been in cell culture, where the way in which synapses tend to form are very stochastic and multiple different things that are there. So what we did essentially is that we incubated the brain slices, live brain slices of the mice with the AHA, which happens to be yellow, and either the heavy isotope or the medium isotope arginine lysine, which are the green and the red dots. And we had peptides that were dually labeled. The good thing about AHA is that because of the biotin tag and because of the alkyne tag, you can actually use it in a, a in a pull down, okay, in an alkyne raisin, so as to enrich for the newly synthesized proteins. And once we had it, because we had combined condition one and condition two, we could do a within sample ratio metric um, analysis of differentially expressed proteins. This again is the, the proteins that are getting accumulated over a certain window period of time, and it needs to be consistent across runs, okay? So one gets a large variation. And then we actually pull out only the consistently changed proteins across three or four different biological replicates. So we did this in three, in, in the Fragile X case in two different ways. One is 
when you have slices which are doing basal signaling that means they're just going about the housekeeping activities they are not getting stimulated with a big chemical hammer to the head kind of thing and that is what we call as a basal screen this would just tell us normally if all things equal what are the differentially expressed proteins between the fragile x hip, um, hippocampus and the wild type hippocampus of the mouse then what we did is that we challenged it by activating the metabotropic glutamate receptor signaling pathway the gluar 5 which had been the mainstay and the target of the large multi-site clinical trials which were there and what we wanted to do was to get the candidate lists of these and then do a comparison of the candidate selection and here we first started like died in the wool neuroscientists and we all, all always wanted to find neuron specific amper receptors nmda receptors bdnf and all that and be extremely happy about it at which point a very um, um reason inducing um coffee conversation with a bunch of clinicians actually helped us figure out that if we're trying to look at blood we need to look at common proteins between the brain and the blood which not necessarily have to be the type that are the glamorous neurotransmitter receptor types. So we had to come up with a filtering criteria which would actually bring the, the proteomic mining that we were doing to become more relevant for the blood organ system. And for that, what we had to do is step back, remove all our blinkers of being neuroscientists and start looking at what kind of functional clusters actually come up in our mass spec screens. And lo and behold, the first thing that we found was that the top functional clusters in our mass spec screen were not related to synapse biology. The synapse biology actually happened to be one in the third rung. The top ones happened to be dealing with metabolism and a lot of mitochondrial, um, mitochondrial maintenance. Um, we had a lot of stuff about cellular process and uh, regulation, which are all the grays and the oranges that you can see, okay? Synaptic plasticity related proteins, which were the blue and the teal clusters were actually very less. Translation ones were also even lesser than that. So we realized that we are, if we were doing what normal with what classically a uh, neuroscientist would do is go back to the third cluster of the synapse associated proteins or synapse relevant proteins and throw all of these out. But this is what are places where we might find proteins that are identical between the brain and the blood and may actually give us candidate markers to actually bridge the gap between the two organ systems. The second revelation that we had was again about the health and disease. So while we got extremely nice consistent measures in the, in the wild type cohorts, we found very fluctuating measures which actually did not allow us to get good candidates good biological replicate candidates in the fragile x ones so it's almost as if fragile x is a, a has got attention deficit hyperactivity disorder that means every time that we were giving the dhpg stimulation it did its own thing this is a problem because uh, just like if you go to an ATM to get cash, if the ATM is actually acting funny, you will get 500 rupees or 5,000 rupees irrespective of whether you've actually typed in 2,000 rupees. This is where perhaps the disease biology also lies. The fact that consistency was not maintained in the disease system, whereas consistency was actually maintained in the healthy system. So we again had to go through another level of looking at where are the fluctuations coming? Are these the places where we actually will again get potential candidate biomarkers? So having said that, what we found with our candidate list, and uh, we had to go through multiple iterations of how to find these biomarkers, and that is a pattern that we recently got awarded. Um, we got about, out of the common hits, which is about 300 odd proteins, about 47 of them that met criteria. Now, what we wanted to do is that we wanted to assess how many of them can we actually test. And right now we were completely limited by the um, reproducibility of antibodies that are present in the market of whether or not we can find something in the mouse, okay, which can respond to a drug. And in the human, 
okay, whether or not uh, serum concentrations or serum levels of um, these proteins were actually different between the control and fragile X groups. So the first question that we had was of the 13 that we had found um, in the human patients here, how many of them are known to change or be changed in the control versus fragile X patient serum? And what we found is echonitase, which happens to be a Krebs cycle thing. Hexokinase, again another Krebs cycle uh, protein, seem to have pretty well differentiated uh, levels between the control and the fragile X. When we looked at what we would consider as a very neurocentric molecule, which is BDNF, it still has work in the endothelial cells. We found that there were outliers, we had subgroups, but there was actually not much of a difference. Okay, when we then looked at RAS, and this was actually PAN-RAS, this was not K-RAS, H-RAS, or N-RAS, this is PAN-RAS antibody, we found that RAS itself was quite different between the fragile X and thing. And this RAS is going to be determined across different systems. RAS, RASopathies are known to be important in diabetes, they are important in cancers, they are important in neuro uh, uh, disorders as well. Now, if you looked at uh, plain Syngap, metabotropic glucosamate receptor 5, grin to b you really don't see. These are all neurocentric cell surface molecules. And one really didn't find much of a difference. Okay. Now, are we looking at a prognostic, uh, you know, uh, you know, a, pros a prognostic biomarker in RAS and HK? That means you have fragile X patients. They seem to have lowered levels of RAS. Are they going to be the type that one can actually pull through or push through into certain kinds of treatment regimes? So for that, we had to go back to the mouse where we wanted to look at out of the 13 changed, which one of the preclinical targets or the ones that actually had gone through clinical trials, pilot or otherwise, were actually sensitive to the levels of hexokinase or RAS. We actually looked at hexokinase or RAS because those were giving us the most consistent um, results. And here we looked at an S6 kinase inhibitor, which is still a preclinical at the preclinical stage. Lithium, which is approved to use, and there are pilot trials in Fragile X, which have shown efficacy. Metformin, which also in pilot trials have shown efficacy, but metformin is also approved to be given. So we thought that we would look at two approved drugs and one of the more uh, designer ones, and look at how hexokinase levels and RAS levels change upon giving the drugs. And here again, what we found is that differences with start to come. So the S6 kinase inhibitor was not able to change the levels of hexokinase much, but it definitely had differences in the RAS levels. So, it, so, so the target engagement for the S6 kinase seemed to affect the RAS levels much more. Lithium, on the other hand, had an opposite response. You found more effect in the hexokinase levels and almost no effect in the RAS levels. Whereas for metformin, it seemed that you had RAS as well as hexokinase flipping with the, targeting, the target engagement in the blood. So now you had pretty much a two-part biomarker barcode that one could end up using to see a, if the fragile X mouse could be given drug A and whether the drug was actually engaging the target by looking at the two different biomarkers that were there. So one had to roll it out into looking at it in the human. And these are results from a pilot trial that we were able to do with UC Davis, um, in which we had open label metformin, which was given to 17 uh, people with fragile X. And um, this was anywhere between a month to nine months. Uh, they were already doing clinical global impressions, which is a reported way of seeing whether there were differences in their behavioral functionality, their adaptability. It's not an intellectual uh, um, cognitive kind of a test. It's more an uh, impression of whether the person is just behaviorally more fitter. Um, we, they also wanted to look at BMI changes because metformin happens to be a drug that is approved for diabetes and it is known that there are BMI changes which are there. And they were drawing blood. So we were in a position to be able to do 
these uh, levels of RAS and hexokinase in them, along with MMP9, which has been shown earlier to be a readout for metformin's efficacy in mice with fragile X syndrome. So here I'm basically showing the clinical data. And what we found is that the clinical global impressions seem to correlate better with increased hexokinase than RAS. However, RAS was a better predictor of BMI becoming more normal. That means that the person was um, under weight becoming more the normal weight versus a person that was overweight becoming more of the normal weight. So clearly, the hexokinase and RAS again separated in fragile X in this particular clinical trial, one of which helped us understand target engagement, which happened to be RAS, and whether or not all the metformin-related BMI and uh, biochemical pathways were getting engaged or not. And hexokinase showed a potential. The study did not have enough power to be able to be uh, statistically significant. Uh, to actually show that perhaps it can be a predictive biomarker because it correlated with improved CGI scores. So this is the first kind of biomarker where you actually have individual proteins that have been mined from a proteomic screen, then taken from the brain and looked at proxies in the blood, and these have then been put forward. This is going to get developed. But I also talked about a second kind of a biomarker where we just look at the amount of protein synthesis that actually happens in the blood. And since all these metformin, S6 kinase, lithium, all of them have been shown in the brain to impact protein synthesis, that might be a much more gross readout of whether or not actually the biochemical pathways of protein synthesis, a barren protein synthesis in the blood are actually getting engaged. So, for this, we then hit a roadblock because the problem was that de novo blood proteomics is not something that happens. Blood proteomics is always done in serum samples, plasma samples, where it is a humongous glut of secreted proteins, which may be coming from different parts and not from the blood cells itself. Pre-existing, obviously, all of them have been secreted. Uh, they have been, they are from life cells, etc. So one really doesn't know what is being made by the blood cells specifically in a given period of time. Okay. Now, uh, what we uh, actually looked at is we were able to develop using the same click chemistry that I had talked about, the Bonkat pathway, um, a method of doing blood-based. Uh, de novo proteomics, in which we were able to take whole blood in biopsiable volumes, which was about 5 ml from the human and about 200 microliters from the mouse. And we were able to do the click chemistry, and we were able to actually do these kinds of Western blots, not only from mouse, but also from human donors as well. We were able to show that even in the blood in the Fragile X model mouse, you had increased protein synthesis, which is the uh, middle panel here. And we were also able to enrich and pull down specific um, peptides that had been marked with a zero homo alanine or were enriched using alkyne beads. And we were able to actually do LCMS and show that one could get a very different kind of labeled peptides versus the non-labeled peptides in the blood. Now, this is something that is not just relevant for Fragile X. This is relevant for any kind of a metabolic disorder, any kind of a rare genetic disorder, where you would be using blood as a proxy and would actually give us much better traction of looking at things when we actually have blood cells, lymphocytes, erythrocytes as well, because they have ribosomes, platelets actually pushing out the kind of proteins that they are getting made. So the directions of this is essentially going to be therapeutic efficacy detection. We, we want a predictive biomarker. We also want a patient stratification biomarker for this. But we do have unknowns. Specifically, we don't know how this de novo protein synthesis of the blood is going to change as a person ages. How much of it is going to be thrown off if a person has a cold versus has a flu 
has different kinds of nutritional and dietary status, etc. We also don't have enough of a cohort that is big enough to actually start doing informed st uh, statistics. And a lot of this is essentially, uh, there are a lot of confounds in between where different kinds of tests are done in order to evaluate the behavioral performance of different subsets of people. So we have to be in a position to be able to map them out and bring them back into the same page. So, uh, one second. Yeah, so it actually, now what we are in a position to do is to partner with different kinds of people. And it takes a village to actually do this. Apart from the government and the policy, we already have the basic research here. We have the clinical um, practitioners on board, but say in India and all that, it's not something that one actually sees any clinical trials of this form because of the huge patient burden, which is there. For it to be rolled out in point of care in community health uh, kind of places, one needs certain mechanisms to be in place we need to make these tests as non-invasive as possible. A blood draw is never going to be without a needle. So we need to be in a position to be able to um, figure this out. We need probably kits that can stand going to different parts of India in different temperature conditions, whether or not the cold chain is actually maintained. And of course, the price point becomes very, very important. So we would like to engage with all these stakeholders at various given points of time in India, in the United States, to actually go abroad and see ways in which we can take this forward. So with that, I'd like to end. A uh, majority of this work was actually done at NYU, and Heather Bowling and Eric Klan are people who are on the patent, who are my um, partners in crime for all of this. A lot of the clinical work was done at the Rush Medical University in Chicago and Flora Tassone. And of course, at INSTEM, we were able to do all the proteomics and uh, we are trying to extend the protein synthesis hypothesis to other forms of autism as well. These are my funding uh, sources and I would be happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Aditi, for a wonderful talk and uh, providing us insight as to what goes on the, in the background. Um, um, we have a few questions. Well, one or two we have online. I have also received some few questions on my WhatsApp uh, as well. So uh, I think uh, first question, I'll just let uh, uh, Professor Kaushika uh, talk. Uh, she has a question. Ma'am, uh, do you want to ask it or do you want me to ask it on your behalf? I'm happy to ask it. I can ask. Okay, so. Uh, Hello, Sandhya. Uh, Professor, Professor Kaushika. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. It was very beautiful work and um, really exciting. I was very curious as to. So, you started off your second half of your talk. Um, saying that you needed to stratify patients uh, because of these other other symptoms. I, I apologize, I almost said phenotypes. Other symptoms that you see in patients. and uh, But you nonetheless think translation dysregulation is a common theme. Now, I wanted to ask you, because I have read and I'm by no means any expert, you think all the way from pervasive uh, PDD all the way to autism, it's often projected as a spectrum, right? So do you actually believe that um, translation dysregulation will be a common theme across all of this, or is it only going to be restricted to say complex? Because that, I mean, what struck me is not only the beauty of the work, but it took you nine years to get here. and. Uh, how the last slide was particularly relevant. How easy is it going to be to use as a diagnostic for rare disease in a country like ours? So I'm kind of worried about that. The science part, which is exciting also to think about, and I, and also from the patient end. Right. So um, 
three or four points to that uh, question. And I think it just very nicely um, summarizes a lot of the stuff that I was trying to say. So whatever I showed uh, about translation dysregulation, I specifically meant it in context of Fragile X. So when I'm saying different kinds of subgroups within Fragile X, um, I'm talking, uh, there have been patient-derived cell lines, which have been found from a lot of these uh, um, patients, and they fall within a spectrum of, uh, of very high levels of protein synthesis, or medium high, or not so much. So clearly, the protein synthesis itself there also falls into a certain spectrum. That's so for fragile X. Fragile X is your most um, straightforward molecular correlate kind of a thing, which is there. Now, the work that I've been doing at Instem over the past five years, I've been trying to ask exactly this question of whether other syndromic forms of autism, which have got nothing to do with translation, uh, uh, catnap, uh, uh, you know, NRXN, uh, uh, all of those, you know, the ones where you have a synaptic dysfunction, but will they also have a protein synthesis dysfunction or not has been a mainstay of the kind of work that we've been doing. And what we found is not basally the way that we find in Fragile X that you just take cells from Fragile X patient, you take cells from a normal, you will have a difference in protein synthesis. It doesn't come up that way. Okay, but the way in which it comes up is when the neural circuit gets challenged with a certain behavior. So for neuroligin 3, what we found is that it had altered um, fear recall memory. Okay, and the problem, so when the animals were happily moving around and all that, and when we actually looked at protein synthesis there, you didn't have any differences. But as soon as you wanted them to encode memory, and in this case, in the amygdala, we found there was a problem in protein synthesis. And if you actually uh, then tinkered with the protein synthesis at exactly that time, you found that the behavioral uh, freezing actually came back. So it's possible that then it becomes a very bespoke kind of thing that, you know, for other conditions, you would basically look at the condition, you would look at the neural uh, circuitry, which is there, you would see at what place, what kind of protein synthesis difference would you get? And then according to that, you would either tone down the protein synthesis or jack up the protein synthesis. Okay, but now what happens is it becomes extremely tailor-made and it becomes very bespoke. And then you have all these problems of, um, it's very easy to uh, jack down protein synthesis, but it's very hard to activate protein synthesis without having other off-target effects because of just the kind of cognitive enhancers we have. So uh, what do you do in that kind of a situation? So these are the questions that have now started to come up from our basic work, which is there. The other problem is that uh, in humans, it's very difficult to measure in vivo protein synthesis. There is actually no proper way or there are no proper probes to actually do it. So we'll always be doing this in surrogate uh, animals and hope that the translational gap gets um, um, bridged properly. So protein synthesis per se may not be the answer, but for the ones that have something to do with the signaling cascades and the rare, the rare conditions um, where the mutation actually impacts protein synthesis, one can actually think of this in a way. So that would be one way. Uh, it would be foolish of any one of us to think of one particular biomarker test for fragile X or for autism. It's not possible. We will have to actually look at it as a companion diagnostics. That means you have a behavioral diagnostics, you have a language diagnostics, which actually has started to come where now you have these tiny little recorders um, where you can actually give it within the toddler's uh, thing and it tends to record and it actually gives you exactly how the language is getting developed. Um, so you've got all of these, you've got these small little strip fMRIs that you know you can actually put in here. So you can actually start looking at the development of the brain and the imaging. All of this has to come together. And we also will need um, very 
uh, hardcore statistics, machine learning, AI driven things, which will be able to pull out the correlations much better for us to make algorithms which are there. So very much work in progress, um, but most of the autism field is going ahead with the imaging, the mechanical and the language biomarkers because they are not invasive. But the caveat for that mostly is that at the end of it, the parents also want to be able to give a drug for which then all the biochemical ones will come up. So each of these will have to develop on their own and then we, we're probably going to have a handshake at some point. Or that's my hope. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Dr. Aditi. Uh, uh, we have one, one or two small short questions. Uh, and then we uh, we will wrap up. Other questions we will uh, send to Dr. Aditi directly via email yeah. and yeah. then uh, communicate to you. One question we had from the audience is uh, um, they, they wanted to know about uh, mucopolysaccharidosis 2, which is mm -hmm. more like a, a, a proteoglycan disorder. So there, how do you, uh, like uh, when you do proteomics, would you be able to differentiate between just protein or proteoglycans? Uh, is, is it possible to do or that is a separate uh, kind of field? How, how is it? Well, uh, glycoproteomics is a definite field and uh, Dr. Utpal Tatu in ISC would be a, a person to actually look at his work. He has a fair bit of work on that. I am aware that he is uh, starting to do some uh, clinical samples for that. So he would be uh, the better expert for that. Now, I want to clarify that the kind of proteomics that we are talking about here is before the post-translational modification has actually come up. Mm -hmm. So it is very, very possible that we can take the blood of the person with this particular condition and um, look at the kind of proteins that are getting made by the blood cells and some of which may actually be glycoproteins. It's very possible to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so it is possible that we can do that because we are looking at all peptides. Uh, if I go back to our data set, uh, this data set will be freely available, um, uh, open access. So, so the person can actually also look at the kind of hits that we got and can look at whether or not glycoproteins are there. Wonderful. And I'm pretty sure that we would. So there are two short questions. One is what kind of cost are we looking at? I mean, is it possible for anybody to generally just say, uh, take my blood, let me see what protein uh, changes are there, what kind of uh, ballpark uh, you, you can talk about? So if I look at it, uh, that's something that minimally we are talking about uh, just the mass spec run per se right now with the current kind of commercial uh, outfits that are there. Uh, you'd likely be looking at 4,000 to 5,000 rupees right there in the mass spec run. The reagents, etc., are going to be different. Now, of course, this is at a stage in which um, when um, genomics was $50,000. Uh, okay, so right now we are at a proof of principle stage. We are not at the high throughput analysis stage. So as the uh, cost of the genomic sequencing has come down considerably, and now if you have targeted SNB panels, which you can get for 8,000, um, seven to 8,000 rupees, depending on the kind of condition you have, this has taken close to 25 years. Now we don't expect the technology to be an impediment, but for the databases and the panels to be ready and to be scalable so that one can actually make a kit, um, one would actually be looking at at least five to six years for it to get validated in a bigger cohort. Whatever we've shown is in 17 human beings. This is not going to be enough to be able to get approval. One usually ends up requiring 300 to 400 uh, co uh, people across multiple sites um, in order to be able to do that. And then a person can make a kit. So that's where we are, but we are hoping that we can actually defray the costs. Um, at this point, um, there are strand, uh, strand genomics does have a fairly decent um, neuro rare disease panel. Um, about 80 highly penetrant genes, um, uh, and they have this uh, multiplexed PCR kind of uh, 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 thing, which is there. So uh, that's the best that I know for that. 
but for other rare diseases i'm sure you people know better yeah so from the so, so as you said that particular jump from uh, genomic to understanding protein level uh, and making clinical decisions uh, or clinical trial decision based on the proteins that would be uh, that is something that is yet to catch up so oh, here i have a last question to ask uh, if swami uh, please permit me um, so the question is that so uh, so there is this requirement for uh, the, the, you are generating a huge amount of data and there is a requirement for a proper amount of informatics as you again mentioned um, so this trans uh, so if i if i may call it as a uh, uh, you are uh, this part the particular inform informatic related uh, info informatic related services plus storing of the patient samples so what what has been done in india uh, in india so far to address the kind of questions that you are asking uh, 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 is is it easy to easy for researchers like you to get get access to patient uh, uh, blood samples so that you can do this kind of research on a large scale hts so what sort of support are you looking at well mostly it's been uh, um, two fold one is a uh, lack of collaborators who would be in a position to be able to do it in a specific way um because we need actual uh, the the blood needs to be picked up has to be contacted with the amino acid probe and then stored in a certain way so this in itself has been a challenge the second thing has been also funding um uh, so this i have been told pretty much on my face uh, that um, autism is a first world problem and uh, india really does not have to worry about that right now so uh, this is as appalling to me as i'm sure to uh, many many people here in the audience so one has to look at other alternate sources of doing this um we have been able to the only silver lining in this is we've been able to bring together a lot of the patient um, and uh, autism school based networks together to actually start thinking about first just a genetic screening and then start thinking about uh, proteomic or metabolomic biomarkers and all that again funding is a problem and now with covid this is definitely going to be at the back burner for a considerable amount of time thank you dr aditi hope uh, your talk uh, 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 helps other people so there is another question can a technology which is very sensitive and specific to biomarkers maybe cytokines or hormones will be of any help understanding disease progression and validating a marker the same can be seen for approval for diagnosis can be used so they are looking yes. at other other than protein whether other biomarkers might be yeah sure absolutely so uh, there are cytokine arrays which are there um, and it is known for specific kinds of autism that there is maternal immune um, activation um, in the second and the third trimester which actually causes a, a huge cytokine storm which tends to pattern the brain the developing fetuses brain slightly differently so looking at circulating levels of those cytokines is definitely something that is being pursued pretty aggressively and in the hope is that uh, these would be screened um, and would come into general screening for a pregnant mother at that time wonderful dr aditi thanks a lot for spending your time with us and enlightening us with boncat and her uh, boncat fan cat has been the Uh, kind of things we have been listening for a while now and uh, but it's it was really enthralling to me at least and i'm sure we had uh, far more than 25 participants and i'm sure most of them uh really uh, they take this message as to there is a next generation thing which india is known to miss the bus all the time uh, but hopefully uh, at least rare disease uh, we should be able to put together some resources to help researchers like you to get uh, 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 to get us ahead yeah thank you so much for all of you for giving the time and for listening